We have seen in the foregoing chapter of the received tradition about Abraham's journey from Ur of the Chaldees to Canaan by the way of Haran is not an originally independent tradition about Abraham. Rather, it is a historiographical reconstruction which is based on several originally independent and conflicting traditions, if not only must be understood as unhistorical, but any attempt to find movements analogous to Abraham's in the history of the Near East are essentially misdirected for the purposes of biblical interpretation. The intentions of the biblical traditions about the patriarchs are not comparable to those of the modern historian. They are rather sociological, political, and religious. Those attempts at interpretation of these traditions which willfully neglect the implications of their formations and structure can justly be dismissed as historicism. Moreover, we have seen that the biblical chronologies are not grounded on historical memory, but are rather based on a very late theological schema that presupposes a very unhistorical worldview. Those efforts to use the biblical narratives for a reconstruction of the history of the Near East in a manner comparable to the use of the archives of Mari and similar finds can justly be dismissed as fundamentalist. Though we have argued that the quest for the historical Abraham is basically fruitless occupation both for the historian and the student of the Bible, the question about the historical background of the patriarchal narratives is a question to which the historical criticism, with the help of the ancient Near Eastern history and archaeology, can give very concrete answers. In 1974, this piece of writing was so scandalous when it emerged that its author, Thompson, found himself facing a decade-long involuntary vacation from employment. By 1992, his academic antics led to an unceremonious exit from Marquette University's hallowed halls. From the disco-infused 70s to the grunge era of the 90s, he, alongside the likes of Philip R. Davies, Niels Peter Lemsky, and Keith W. Whitelam, was knee-deep in decoding the enigma dubbed Ancient Israel. Their work wasn't just groundbreaking, it was earth-shattering, especially in the world of Old Testament studies. Much of his brilliant banter, most of his argumentation, was centered around names of the patriarchs, as Thompson says in his 1974 book. It will be my contention throughout this process of historicizing Genesis is a serious error in biblical interpretation and to the extent that it depends upon the evidence we have from Near Eastern nomenclature. Totally unfounded. Some questions which must be asked of our evidence are, do the names really demonstrate or make more probable the historicity of the patriarchs? Do they help to date the period in which the patriarchs belong? Do they support the thesis that the narratives of Genesis mirror the history of the second millennium, specifically the movements of the Amorites? Ultimately, Thompson broke the consensus on Abraham's historicity. Most critical scholars these days have forsaken the attempt to finding Abe. If there ever was a guy, he's lost to us, as is his sons, all the way to Moses. If there ever was an exodus, it is absolutely nothing like the Bible describes it. The same can be said about the united monarchy with King David and Solomon. The more we dig, the more scandalous it seems that the Bible is not historically accurate. But is that the author's goal? Are they trying to convince their readers and hearers of a fake history as Plato recommended in his writings? Russell Gamirkin has spoken several times about Plato's noble lies and how to create a great nation. In the historical pursuit of the biblical patriarchs, many scholars equipped with both archeological tools and scripture 
sought empirical confirmation of these iconic figures. In Egypt, one is presented with names from first immediate period, circa 2181 to 2055 BCE, associated with Abraham and believed to be Amorites. This association arises because of the phonetic resemblance to the Amuru from South Mesopotamia emerging around the same epoch. Parallelly, the Hyksos, linked to Jacob and Joseph, are perceived as invaders with Amorite affiliations. Curiously, it's the nomenclature of these patriarchs that seemingly connect these historical dots, allowing scholars to interpret these tales as condensed history of the Near East during the second millennium. Thompson's scholarship underscores that these patriarchal names weren't exclusive to the second millennium BCE, but echoed into the fourth century BCE across diverse locales, including Mesopotamia. The existence of Abraham has often been posited on the corroborative elements like the geographic references in Genesis. However, it's essential to note that these places endured well into the Hellenistic era. Thompson delves deeply into the significance of Abraham's name in this context. I proffer a contention. When drafting foundational stories of a nation, it's likely that authors might retroject their primeval figures into antiquated settings, lending a veneer of authenticity. Take, for instance, the esteemed archaeologist Israel Finkelstein. He views the biblical narration of Canaan's conquest in Joshua as less of an authentic historical account and more as a late 7th century BCE ideological blueprint depicting an inspirational conquest under King Josiah of Judah. Finkelstein hypothesizes that this conquest narrative possibly originated in Israel's northern kingdom around the early 8th century BCE, inspired by the remnants of past disturbances. This perspective gains weight considering the lack of archaeological traces for many cited cities or their emergence only in the 8th and 7th centuries BCE. How can one validate a 12th century BCE conquest of cities that archaeologically appear half a millennium later. By this logic, the absence of evidence for Moses' mass exodus from Egypt could whimsically be attributed to celestial beings equipped with dustbusters. Such narratives likely embellished retellings of pure literary creations often weave in contemporaneous nuances inadvertently revealing their true temporal origins. To draw a playful analogy, discovering a gospel where Peter cruises in a Honda Civic would unmistakably hint at a narrative crafted in a more modern milieu. Similarly, Genesis contains anachronisms that point to its later historical genesis, pun intended. In our preceding video explorations, we've journeyed through the tapestries of myth and lore underpinning Genesis 1-11. through Now, as we delve into the tales of Abraham, there's a prevailing sentiment that we've anchored ourselves in the firm ground of historical narrative. Numerous commentaries underscore this demarcation, suggesting a transition from myth to reality right between Genesis 11 and 12. For some scholars, this transformation commences even earlier, with Genesis 11:10 enveloping Terah and his kin's expedition from Ur to Haran in the cloak of history. Over time, I've developed a certain affinity for those discerning minds who interpret these passages as masterful narratives rather than concrete history. This naturally begets the query, when was Genesis scribed? A significant portion of the scholarly community posits its creation during the exile or perhaps the post-exile era, with a handful placing bets on the Persian period. It's paramount to note that their perspective primarily hinges on the priestly source, though not all contend that Genesis, in its entirety, emerged during these times. 
Today, I aim to illuminate the Hellenistic shades painted on Genesis. Post the epoch when Alexander the Great unfurled the essence of the Greek world upon the vast expanse known biblically. Neil Godfrey curates a thought-provoking blog, the link to which is available in the description below with all the sources. His writings delve deep into concepts that sometimes take a while to permeate American scholarly circles. Of particular note is his discourse on Nils Peter Lemke, which I found to be intellectually stimulating. Here are some points in favor of a Hellenistic date after 300 BCE for the Old Testament. Number one, it is a fact that the history of Israel as told by the Old Testament has little, if anything, to do with the real historical developments in Palestine until at least the later part of the Hebrew monarchy. Two, an extensive part of this literature should be considered the creation of the Jewish diaspora. First and foremost, the patriarchal narratives, the story of the Exodus about the Israelites in Egypt and their escape from Egypt, but also the conquest narratives in Joshua. All of these aim at one and the same issue, at the more or less utopian idea that a major Jewish kingdom, even empire, should be established or re-established in Palestine, an idea that emerged in spite of the fact that it had no background in ancient Israelite empire. Number three, the writers who invented the history of Israel seem to have modeled their history on a Greek pattern. Herodotus being the earliest point of comparison, there are a number of similarities between the histories of Herodotus and the Old Testament. Both histories have as their beginning a perspective that encompasses the whole world as such, and this perspective narrows down to single nations only at a later point, respectively the Greek and the Hebrew. The biblical historians display a knowledge of Greek tradition and this could hardly have been the case before Greek historians were to become known and read in the Near East. Number four, the Persian period does not seem to fit the requirements of being the time when the historical books of the Old Testament were written down. First of all, it would have to be proved that Greek authors were known and extensively read in the Persian Empire, and I very much doubt that this was the case. Lemke goes into far more responses to this issue of a later dating of the Old Testament, but consider it as we dive deeper into this documentary. 